Hey, welcome to class, everyone. Hope you all had a good, restful night and are feeling fresh this morning. Okay, welcome to class. Can um, Anita, can you please lead us in prayer this morning? I think she lost her connection. Can anyone lead us in prayer this morning? Nobody wants to pray? Uh, let's pray. Okay, yeah. thank you, John. Yeah. Father, we want to thank you for this morning. Lord, we submit us uh, as a class to your mighty hands. So, God, we pray that even as we learn today, we pray you would speak to our hearts and encourage us to be deeply rooted in your word and help us, Selena, to teach your word in, uh, in, in a marvelous way. We pray, O oh God, that let your Holy Spirit continue to minister to us this morning. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Okay, so the last uh, few classes we were looking at, uh, we were studying the doctrine of uh, God and we studied that God exists and we looked at various scripture passages which prove to us or show to us that God exists and then we studied the nature of God. Um, to understand the nature of God, we looked at his uh, attributes. So we looked at a lot of attributes of God and hence we were able to understand the characteristic, the attributes, the nature of God. And we also said that the nature of God is revealed in his names, both in the Old and the New Testament. So we looked at uh, a lot of names in the uh, Old Testament where God reveals himself and hence he is revealing who he is and um, what he does. And we just looked at the uh, one main um, uh, name of God in the, uh, okay, the old land knew that is the father, but uh, most of the names that we saw uh, or we studied was the names that are mentioned in the Old Testament. And we saw a few of the Greek um, words mentioned in the New Testament. Okay, so today we are going to look at uh, study the doctrine of Trinity. Uh, I hope you all had taken some time to read the doctrine of God. Any one of you have any questions? Any doubts to the doctrine of God? Okay, if not, uh, we'll move on to the chapter four, which is uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay. So uh, when you think of this word Trinity, of course, we've already spoken about it in uh, the last few classes. Uh, what is your understanding of uh, Trinity? What is your understanding of Trinity? God uh, exists in three persons and each person is fully God. And there is one God. Okay, there is one God who exists in three persons and each one of them are fully God. Okay, thank you, John. Yes, Isaac? Yes, three persons in one God. God of three persons. in three persons. Yeah. Okay, one God who revealed himself in three persons. Okay. What else do you understand about Trinity? Is the word uh, Trinity, sorry, somebody wanted to say something? Okay, is the word Trinity mentioned in the Bible? No. No? Okay. Then how did we get this whole concept of Trinity? Trinity as a word is not mentioned, but we can see Father, Son and Holy Spirit operating together in multiple scriptures. Okay, the word Trinity, thank you, John. The word uh, Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, but we see various, uh, you know, uh, instances where uh, we see uh, 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in action. Uh, we see the concept of Trinity in, uh, in Scripture. And hence we have, uh, you know, uh, coined this word Trinity to talk about one God who revealed himself or externally exists as three persons. Okay. So uh, is Trinity an important doctrine, the Christian faith? Yes, no? Yes, it yeah. is. Okay, why do you say yes, Isaac? Why do you say it's an important doctrine? Well, it shows uh, how God operates because he operates in the Son, operates in the, uh, in the Spirit. Now the Son, and, the Son and the Father are up in heaven, though they are omnipresent, but the Spirit is with us. So it's important to to look at the good head or the Godhead as the Trinity. Thank you. Yes, uh, it's so important for us to understand this whole concept of uh, uh, Trinity because uh, you know um, God has revealed Himself uh, to us in person, and uh, for us to relate to Him. Uh, we need to understand this whole concept of Trinity and it's the most, uh, uh, you know, apart from the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the whole concept of Trinity is very misunderstood and people don't believe in that. People don't understand this whole concept. So it's very important for us to, um, you know, understand it uh, clearly uh, in the light of scripture, uh, also to have clarity on um, uh, about Trinity uh, and also to uh, so that we can be able to, uh, you know, uh, relate to the three persons in the Trinity, though they are one God, and also for us to minister to others. Okay. Yes, John, you were saying something uh, about the importance of the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah, uh, as Isaac mentioned, it helps us to understand how God operates uh, and also helps us to relate to God. Yeah, I just wanted to say that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it's very important for us to understand the doctrine of Trinity because, uh, you know, we understand then how God operates. And it's also very important for us to understand this doctrine because it helps us to relate uh, to the three persons. Uh, it helps us to uh, relate to God, uh, uh, you know, in our own uh, uh, limited understanding of this infinite, great, awesome, mighty uh, God. So um, we will look at uh, the doctrine of uh, Trinity as it's mentioned in um, uh, Scripture. Okay, so uh, how do we define Trinity? It is uh, God who eternally uh, exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each person is fully God and there is one God. So you can say one God who eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and or you can say one God who revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's important for you to have a clarity or a clear idea of the definition of uh, Trinity. Okay, so it is God or one God who eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each one of them are fully God. Okay, or it is God who revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, now um, uh, what do we understand by this word Trinity? What is the meaning of Trinity? What is the meaning of Trinity? I had this understanding like three persons in one. Okay, three persons in one. Uh, are you defining uh, uh, the word? Are you defining Trinity or you're just giving me the meaning of the word Trinity? I'm defining, like just giving the concept that I had about it. Okay, thank you, Joy. So uh, it's it's that's why I said you need more clarity in that. You should say one God in three who revealed Himself in three persons, or you need to say one God who eternally exists as. 
three persons. Okay, so that will give uh, them more clarity when we're talking about uh, the word Trinity. Uh, how was this word coined, Trinity? How did this word come up, come into existence or being? Trinity, tri unity. Okay, so uh, three in oneness. Okay, so Trinity is tri unity, three in uh, oneness. Is the word um, we we uh, we already said in the beginning of the class. This word Trinity is not uh, mentioned in Scripture, uh, but is the concept of the teaching uh, of uh, Trinity found in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, or is it in both? Old and New Testament. Is the doctrine of Trinity found only in the New Testament? Is it also found in the Old Testament or is it uh, found both in the Old and New Testament? Yes, go ahead, Lupega. I think it is found in both Testament. Evidence can be found in Genesis 1.1. We can see God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit there because when you read it, it actually says the Spirit of God was hovering over the water, and and we know that when God said, "Let there be light," He was that was Jesus Christ being mentioned there. So I think it is there all through the Scripture. We are seeing evidences of the Holy Trinity there. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Lubega. Yeah, so we see the concept or the doctrine of Trinity uh, throughout Scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Uh, now, if we say it's not mentioned in the Old Testament, then we can be wrong because, uh, you know, we're saying that Trinity is one God who eternally exists in three persons. And if he eternally exists, that means he has to reveal himself even in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Okay, so uh, if we say that he eternally exists as three persons, then it would be surprising for us to find no indications of it in the Old Testament. So we look at some scripture passages in the Old Testament and we look at a few passages in the New Testament where uh, the doctrine of Trinity is found. Now it's not explicitly or very clearly uh, mentioned in the Old Testament, but there are several passages uh, which imply that God exists as more than one person. And if you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, if you can all open to your Bibles, please. And um, one of you can uh, turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, someone else can turn to Genesis 3, uh, 22. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Uh, someone else, uh, Genesis 11, verse 7. Someone else can read Isaiah 6, 8, and another person can read Psalm 110, verse 1. So that's Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 3, 22, Genesis 11, 7, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Psalms 110, verse 1. Okay, so can somebody read uh, Genesis 1, 26, please? Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and, and over all the centuries that move along the ground. Thank you. So here we see that God says, let us make man. Okay, so us, it's a plural, just talking about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Then the Lord said again, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now this he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is after Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, God says a man has become like one of us. Again, plural. Okay, talking about the Trinity and... Um, uh, the next one, Genesis 11, verse 7. Come, let us go down in their confused, confusing mix of their language, so that they will not understand one another's speech. 
Thank you, Joy. So here the, the people are building the Tower of Babel. And so God says, come, let us go down. So us, again, talking about the plural sense. Uh, uh, and again, the concept of Trinity mentioned here. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. So here God is basically calling Isaiah and uh, says, so, uh, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Okay, again, uh, plural us. Psalm 110, verse 1. Can somebody read Psalm 110 verse 1, please? Psalms 110 verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Thank you. So here uh, the Psalmist David is saying the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Okay, so here we see Jesus also quotes this in Matthew chapter 22 verses 41 to 46. And um, he rightly understands that David is referring to two separate persons as Lord, um, uh, you know, but who is uh, David's Lord here? Okay. If it is not God himself. Okay. So here he says, the Lord say, David says, the Lord says to my Lord. So who is David's Lord? It is God himself. So, um, and who could be saying to God, sit at my right hand, except it is somebody who is also fully God. So only somebody who is fully God can tell God, uh, you know, to sit at uh, his right hand. So here we see, uh, if we have to paraphrase this verse in the New Testament perspective, it'll, it'll sound like this, or it'll read like this. God the Father said to God the Son, sit at my right hand. So we see that even without the New Testament writings, uh, you know, on the Trinity or the, con or the doctrine of Trinity, uh, it seems clear to David that uh, he was aware of the plurality of the persons uh, in one God. That means he was aware that there is one God, but, you know, uh, who eternally exists or reveals himself in three persons. So he understood there is a plurality uh, of the persons in one God. And that's why he says, you know, the Lord says to my Lord. Okay. So that is Psalm 110 verse 1. Were you able to understand this? Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you didn't understand anything, you can just, uh, you know, you don't need to unmute your mics. You can just write in the chat section. I'll read it and I'll explain that again. Okay, I hope you'll understood um, Psalm 110, verse 1. Uh, Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10. Can somebody read that, please? Isaiah chapter 63 verses 10. Yet they rebelled. Go on to cut it in the psalm. Yes, go ahead, Sudhikaru. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Okay. Um, so here we see, uh, we read that they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So, um, you know, it says that, um, uh, it, so it's apparently suggesting that both the Holy Spirit and God are distinct personalities. Um, uh, and the Holy Spirit is di distinct from God himself, because here it's mentioned his Holy Spirit. And uh, we also see here that the Holy Spirit can be grieved, uh, which suggests that, you know, as a person, the Holy Spirit has emotional capabilities uh, and which is characteristic of a distinct person. Uh, if you look at Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed 
me. And here also it distinguishes the spirit of the Lord God from the word Lord. Okay, so uh, we see that there are two distinct persons. Okay, uh, the spirit of the Lord God and the Lord, which is separate mentioned uh, distinctly, separately, uh, and also we read in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10, with the Holy Spirit is distinct from God himself, and we see his emotional capabilities or characteristic here, uh, which is uh, showing, uh, you know, the characteristic of a person. Uh, but in, in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, uh, we don't read about any uh, personal qualities uh, attributed to the Holy Spirit in this verse, but we know that as a person, the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, also is an emotional being and has uh, emotions. He can be grieved, he can be angered, uh, he can be, uh, the, uh, you know, we can quench the Spirit of God. And so we see, you know, distinct personalities or distinct, the Holy Spirit is distinct from God Him. Self, okay. So these are a few verses we looked at in the um, Old Testament. We look at uh, a few more uh, revelations about the doctrine of Trinity in the New Testament, um, um, and um, we'll see where uh, the Trinity is in action in the New Testament, uh, which is one place we see the Trinity in action in the New Testament. Baptism. Of yes, Jesus. thank you. Uh, the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Um, we see that, uh, you know, uh, when Jesus came out of the water, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove, and then the voice of the Father was uh, heard as well. So we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also read about uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit mentioned very clearly in the, Old, in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Um, what is Matthew 28, verse 19? It's uh, the Great Commission. Yeah, it's referred to as the Great Commission. Thank you. So, can somebody, uh, does anyone know that? Memorize that? Or anyone wants to read Matthew chapter 28, verse 19? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Yes, thank you. So here we see uh, the Trinity mentioned, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's important for us to, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep in mind or memorize these scripture passages uh, so that, you know, when people ask us about the Trinity, if they have doubts, we can quickly lead them to these, uh, to these uh, verses um, uh, and uh, so that they can understand better and they know that, you know, God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit, three distinct persons, and they are mentioned in the Bible. Okay. The next one is in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 14, where we see Paul's conclusion, his benediction, and there again Trinity is mentioned. So can somebody read 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, please? Somebody else can turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, uh, and someone else to 1 Peter 1, uh, verse 2, and someone else to Jude chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. So that is um, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, and Jude chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. So can somebody read 2 Corinthians 13, 14? Second Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, Paul mentioned the Trinity. So can some read that success? Read that success. Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 4 to 6. He said, there is one body and one spirit, just as there is one O to which God has called. Verse 5, there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Verse 6, there is one God and Father of all people, who is the Lord of all works, 
through all and is in all. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So Amen. here we Thank see you. there so is success girl yeah thank you okay so there's one spirit uh, one lord and uh, one god and the father of all okay so we see father son and holy spirit uh, peter mentions of the trinity in um, first peter chapter 1 verse 2 can somebody read that please first peter chapter 1 verse 2 it says elect according to the foreknowledge of god the father in sanctification of the spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Here again, God the Father, uh, sanctification work of the Holy Spirit and the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Then we read in Jude chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, which is an exhortation to build our faith. Uh, can anyone read that, please? But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Thank you. So we say uh, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God and um, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So all of these passages uh, we see uh, Trinity mentioned, we also see Trinity in action in uh, the baptism of uh, uh, Jesus, which we saw in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Okay, so oh, we'll summarize this, uh, the biblical teaching on the Trinity in three statements. The first statement is God is three persons. Okay, uh, so the fact that uh, God is three persons means that the Father is not the Son. Okay, the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'll repeat that again. Um, the fact that God is three persons, it means that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Father is not the Holy Spirit. Uh, each one of them are distinct persons. Okay, um, and we have also seen the distinction of the three persons mentioned in the passages uh, that we read earlier. We'll also look at a few more uh, in uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We've already looked at this, uh, you know, uh, chapter and this verses a couple of times. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. So we see the word is Jesus and God, two separate distinct uh, persons. And we also read about, uh, uh, you know, th them being distinct in John chapter 14, verse 26 and 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. So can somebody read uh, John chapter 14, verse 26? And can somebody else read 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, please? John chapter 14, verse 26. John chapter 14, verses 26. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you everything I have said to you. Thank you. So here we see the Holy Spirit mentioned, the Father, uh, who will send in my name. So Jesus is uh, saying this to his disciples in my name. The capital M is talking about the person Jesus. And he says he will teach you all things. Okay. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Okay, so here again we see the ad, uh, advocate. Uh, who is the advocate? It's, uh, it's uh, the Holy Spirit with the Father and also Jesus Christ mentioned. Okay, so the first summary uh, of the Old Testament teaching, the first statement is God is three persons and they are three distinct persons, Father, Son, 
Holy Spirit. The second statement uh, with which we can summarize the teachings of the or the doctrine of the Trinity in uh, in Scripture is that each person is fully God. Okay, God the Father is clearly God. God the Son is also fully God, and God the Holy Spirit is also fully God. So we see this in Genesis chapter one, verse one. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Where it's talking about God the Father, and He's clearly mentioned as God. Uh, God the Son is also fully God. Oh, we uh, we uh, have also looked at it in John chapter one. Verses 1 to 4 and verse 14. Uh, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And it talks about that he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him is life and the life was the light of men. And we read in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we establish the fact already that Jesus is God and it shows us from scripture in John chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 and verse 14 that uh, uh, God the Son is also fully uh, God. Okay. Now God, the Holy Spirit is also fully God. Holy Spirit is God. He's not the force of God. He's not the power of God. Um, uh, you know, he is himself God. Uh, we read this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Uh, we already read that, you know, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which proves that he's also uh, God. And uh, in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, in Acts chapter 5, we read about Ananias and Sapphira, uh, you know, this uh, couple who sell a piece of their uh, property and they bring uh, their, uh, their money to Peter. And then, you know, they are lying to him because they've kept back um, some amount of money. And then uh, Peter asked them, you know, um, you know, how can you lie to the Holy Spirit in verse 5? Uh, sorry, in chapter 5, verse 3. And then in verse uh, uh, 4, uh, Peter goes on to say, you have not lied to God. Uh, you have not lied to man, but to God. Okay, so in this two same, in the same uh, passage, in these two verses, he's talking about you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he's saying you've not lied to man, but to God. So, you know, uh, we can uh, conclude that, you know, uh, lying to the Holy Spirit is, uh, is the same as lying to God, showing that the Holy Spirit and God are one and that Holy Spirit is God. Okay, so... Um, now, each person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each one of them possesses the whole being of uh, God himself. That means each one of them have the nature, the attributes, the characteristics that make them God. So each one possesses the whole being of God himself. So the Father possesses the whole being of God himself, the Son also possesses the whole being of God himself and the Holy Spirit similarly possesses the whole being of God himself. Um, so when we speak of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit together, we are not speaking of an, a greater being, uh, someone who is greater than them, uh, just as or similarly when we speak of them individually, when we speak of the Father individually or the Son or the Holy Spirit alone, uh, we are not speaking of one greater than the uh, other. Just like when we speak of all of them together as one, we are not saying that there is somebody greater than them or somebody who is more supreme in authority than them. We understand that they are God, which means that they are supreme authority. Similarly, when we speak about them individually, we are not speaking that one is greater than the uh, other. Okay. Um, uh, so the Father is all of God's being, the Son is also all of God's being, and the Holy Spirit is also all of God's 
being. Now, the third statement uh, is uh, which, which we can summarize the teachings of uh, the doctrinal trinity in the scripture is that there is only one God. Now, where in scripture do we find uh, or do we find the stated in scripture that there is only one God? Yes, no. I repeat my question again. Do we find in anywhere in scripture that uh, where it's mentioned that there is only one God? Yes, Lubega. Yes, go ahead. I think you in Deuteronomy, uh, um, some of the days when Moses was talking to God, uh, God ordered him to say that I'm only one, because this is where the Muslims also get it from, because they believe in the Old Testament. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verses 4 and 5. Okay, uh, so we do find in the Bible where it's clearly mentioned that there is only one God. Uh, and um, that is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, repeat that again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And verse 5, it says, The Lord, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Okay, I'd like you all to remember this, uh, uh, this verse or memorize it, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, because this is where it very clearly mentions to us that the Lord himself is declaring, or God himself is declaring that he is one. Okay, it's very important for us to, to know this because it's important for us to state this and show it to people uh, who say that, you know, we worship three gods. No, we don't have three gods. We just have one God. And that is clearly mentioned in scripture by God himself in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. It's also mentioned in Isaiah 45, verses 5 to 6, but not very explicitly or very clearly. Uh, it says, uh, God says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Okay, so uh, if we can also understand it, some people can say when he says there's no other, that means he's saying there is no other God. Um, okay, but uh, where we read clearly where he's saying the Lord is one, you know, is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. But Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5 and 6 is also good. Um, so where God says, I am the Lord, there is no other, there is no God besides me. Okay, uh, that is in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5. So we see that God is only um, one being. He's not three gods. He's one God who eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Important to have this phrase, uh, you know, uh, uh, memorized. One God who eternally exists in three persons as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or one God who revealed himself in three um, persons. Okay, so if we uh, deny or compromise on any of the three statements that I mentioned, that God is three persons, each person is fully God, and there is only one God, you know, then we are actually compromising or denying the teachings of uh, the scripture or even our faith. Okay, so before we um, uh, move on, uh, does anyone have any questions, any doubts? So you've understood these three statements. God is three persons. Each person is fully God. And there is one God. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Joy, for your response. Thank you, Shubashish. Okay. So if we, uh, thank you, Anita. So if we, you know, if we deny or compromise on these three statements that uh, we just looked at, then, you know, um, we are saying that the entire scripture is uh, uh, is uh, having serious errors, and um, you know is uh, is not there is no clarity in scripture and it's not authoritative. 
Okay. Now we'll uh, go on to answer this question. How is God one? Okay. How is God one even though he eternally exists as three persons? Uh, you know, he is one in essence. Um, and what is the meaning of essence? I had explained this to you. I had told this to you in the previous classes. What is the meaning of essence? He is one in essence means... Essence means just the same thing as being, okay, B-E-I-N-G, okay. Um, it is same as uh, being. Um, so how is, uh, how can there be one God who exists in three persons or eternally exists in three persons? Because um, uh, when we look at essence and person, uh, they are not the same thing, okay? God is one in a certain way. That means uh, in his being, he is uh, uh, totally different. He's in a certain way. Um, and uh, he's uh, three in three different ways as in persons. Um, since God is one in a different way and he is three, the Trinity is not a contradiction, okay? Uh, there would be a contradiction if he said that God is three in the same as he is one. Okay. What we are saying is that God is one, but he uh, eternally exists as three persons. And when we say that, there is no contradiction, but there would be a contradiction if he said that God is three in the same way as he is one, meaning to say that there is three gods uh, uh, same way as there is as he is one is then there is a contradiction. But if we say that there is one God who is revealed himself uh, or eternally exists as three persons, there is no uh, contradiction. And now when we talk about his essence or the his being, and we talk about the person uh, or a person, we are not. It's not just the same thing. God is one in a certain way, in the way of his uh, essence, and uh, and three in a different way. In when we look at it uh, with uh, his, he as being a person. Okay, I'll explain this a little later. Um, so um, a closer look. If you look at, uh, take a closer look at the fact that God is one in essence, but three in persons, uh, it uh, it really shows us that uh, you know there is no contradiction uh, when it, uh, about this whole doctrine of uh, Trinity. Okay, so how does it show us? Uh, you know, you know how does it show us why there is only one God instead of three? It's uh, very simple. All three persons are one God. Uh, because all three of them have the same essence, okay? So why is there no contradiction? Because all three of them have the same essence, hence they, they are one, okay? But they, uh, you know, eternally exist as three persons. So we said essence is the same as being. Uh, so God is only one in essence. That means he is only one being. He is not three beings. Okay. So he's one in essence and uh, but three persons. Okay. So I hope you are understanding what I'm saying. Yes, no. Okay, uh, if you're a little confused, don't worry. I'll explain uh, further, then you'll be able to understand. But we're basically able, uh, trying to uh, explain how can there be, how can we say that there is one God who eternally exists as three persons, and uh, why is there no contradiction when it comes to the Trinity? Because there's one God, because and uh, there are three persons, and each person has uh, the same essence of. God. That means that all three are God. They are the same being as God, and hence all three of them are uh, God. Okay, and so they are just one, but not three gods. If you say three gods, then we're talking about three different, uh, 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 you know, gods. But we're saying there's one God who exists or eternally exists as three persons, and then we're saying that there is only one essence. So each one of them have the same essence. Okay. Um, 
and this is very uh, important for us to understand that all three persons have the same uh, essence. Uh, if we deny this, then we have denied uh, God's unity uh, and we affirm or believe that there is more than one being of God. Uh, that means there is more than one God. Okay. One in essence and operates in three uh, persons. Yes, there is one God. Uh, who eternally uh, exists or reveals himself in three persons. Yes, operates in three persons. That's fine. And all three of them have the same essence because they are one. Okay. Thank you, Joy. So, so far we've just seen, uh, you know, we've just had a basic understanding of the Trinity, uh, but it's uh, possible for us to go deeper so that we can understand more precisely uh, what we mean by essence and person uh, and how, uh, you know, these two terms are different, how they differ, but how they relate. Um, and then we'll have a complete understanding of Trinity. So in the next class, we will look at uh, what is really the meaning of essence and person, uh, even though you know, God is one in essence, but reveals himself in three persons. And the word essence and uh, person are, does not mean the same. Uh, uh, and how do they, these two terms differ, but how do they relate to each other? Uh, when we understand this, we will be able to understand completely uh, the, the doctrine of Trinity. So next class, we will look at uh, uh, a little more detail into what is the meaning of essence and what do we mean by person, and hence we'll be able to understand completely uh, the doctrine of Trinity. Okay, so stop here. Anyone has any questions, any doubts? Were you able to understand the, la the last bit of what I said about essence? about contradiction. There's no contradiction in uh, Trinity because we're saying that there's one God. We're not saying there's three gods. And we're saying that there are three persons and all three persons have the same essence, the same essence or the same being as God. Okay, Hence, they are all fully God. And so there's one God who reveals himself or eternally exists in three persons. So I hope you will uh, take time to read through the notes, um, learn the definition of Trinity, very important. Uh, also try to memorize the scripture passages where we find Trinity and where it's mentioned uh, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 3 to 4, that the Lord God is one. Okay, And then we'll see you all for the next class. Um, uh, we'll continue about uh, this doctrine of Trinity on Friday. Okay, thank you all for uh, joining. Have a good day and see you all uh, on Friday. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.